Just wanted to give a little context and welcome you on behalf of the museum. This is one of a series of programs that we've started to develop in a project we're calling Radical Roots, New Approaches to Family History. And uh, this will be unfolding over the next couple of years as we um, do new programs and exhibits. Uh, we currently have an exhibit in our museum called Family in Pieces. And I believe Deborah George, the, the curator of the exhibit is here tonight. Um, Deborah did some fascinating digging into her family history and then applied her artistic visions to how to present that history in a new and interesting way. And so we're excited to give people access to that. And I know Susan will tell you, she's got some intersections of art and family genealogy as well. Um, we've also built a memory lab down in our library. So any of you who are looking for access to ways to digitize some of your family history, um, be it photos or videos or audio files, um, you can come in and bring a thumb drive and use our equipment to make digital copies and share that around the world, wherever your family may be. Um, and then we're doing programs like this uh, to uh, give people new ideas, new thoughts about how to approach family history. So uh, thanks again for being here. Let me just jump over and give you a brief introduction of Susan and then I'll let her take it away. So. Susan Weinberg is an artist, author, professional genealogist, and frequent presenter. She describes the common thread in all of her pursuits as solving puzzles and telling stories, an apt description of much of what family history involves. She often writes about genealogy topics, including as a regular Grow Your Family Tree columnist in Hennepin History, our museum's member magazine. Susan's the president of the Minnesota Jewish Genealogical Society and serves on the board of International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies and the Jewish Historical Society of the Upper Midwest. She creates art in her studio in the California building in Northeast Minneapolis, often on family history themes. For more information, visit her and genealogy site at studio409arts.com or her book site, wespokejewish.com. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Susan. Um, now, take it away, Susan. Okay, well, I... I'm really happy to be here today because I get to talk about some of my favorite things, which are cases that I solved. So um, it's always nice when you get to the other side uh, and have solved it. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, we're gonna talk about unraveling the puzzle. And by puzzle, we're talking about genealogy puzzles. I'm, I'm a puzzle solver on many levels and how you find the thread to solve a particularly gnarly puzzle. I was looking for an image that, that looked gnarly and I realized it really has a logic to it even though it's gnarly and genealogy puzzles do as well. So um, let's take a look at what falls into the category of gnarly. It's usually a combination of things. If you don't know where your family came from, that's something that we, you know, we can usually find that but if they immigrated before the 1890s, when the immigration manifest does not provide information on that, it gets a little gnarly. When you may know where they came from, but there are a few indexed or online records, that means it's really hard to work overseas, unless you want to hire somebody overseas to go to the archives. If they are indexed, that means somebody went in with, with language capability and pulled out the relevant facts. And from that, even if they're not online, you can approach an archive and see about getting a copy. If they're not indexed, and then you don't know what's out there. So unless they'll do research for you, which many of them do not, uh, you'll be challenged. And if they're online, but not indexed, then it helps if you have some proficiency in the language. So there's a lot of Ukraine, Ukrainian records out there and probably in both Ukrainian and Russian, and they haven't been indexed yet and they're all handwritten. So that's taking something on like that is quite a challenge. And then sometimes when you just don't have a lot of information on family members, so there's not a lot to cross check. So when you find a record, you need to figure out how does it connect to your family? And if you know a little bit about your family history, that helps. So I'm gonna talk about two different cases that I've done in the past year that really intrigued me because they were ones that were gnarly and I came at them in kind of an unexpected way. So one approach, and these are just two of many, is what I call the back of an envelope. 
and you'll, you'll see why. And the other is visitors from the past. And those both proved to be the thread that I was able to tug on to solve the puzzle. I always start when I'm working with someone with some very basic questions. I look at, first of all, what do you know? Because we start with what we know and we work to what we don't know. So in this particular case, I asked my client um, what he knew about his family. And he said his grandfather was Joseph Cohen. Joseph's parents, so his great grandparents were Samuel and Lena. They were from Romania and they were from an area that there were not online records when I searched. Joseph Cohen had two sisters who survived to adulthood. They lived in Minneapolis, but then they moved to Milwaukee. And Samuel Cohen's wife was hospitalized sometime after 1905 for the remainder of her life. And it was kind of, it's, it's interesting to me. It's, it, I was working with another case with a very similar situation. And I think because of the timing of it, it was postpartum blues or several children died. There, I could see the trigger events. And I just don't think we knew how to deal with those things at that time. Uh, so um, I've always thought that would be an interesting area to, to dig into genealogically. I always ask them, what do they want to know? No guarantees. I'm going to find exactly what they want to know. I may find something even better. Who knows? He wanted to know uh, if there were other family members in the United States. If so, who are they? Where do they live? And can we work back a generation from Sam, his great grandfather? So those all seem very reasonable. So I always start with building a foundation. And that means I'm I'm, I do a newspaper search. I use newspapers.com. I look for life events. I look for anything I can find, but I focus, I'm interested in life events like obituaries and marriage records because it helps me trace them through their life. I look at city directories and I'm interested in when do they appear and who else is at the same address with who shares a surname. So I, I kind of look for the address matches. I'm trying to build out family members, uh, or related people. I look at census records, same reason, they're grouped in families. And you often can find other information. Sometimes you'll have a mother-in-law living with the family and you, you pick up the maiden name that you may not have known. I also look at ranges, particularly for birth years and immigration years, because it's never just one year. They really didn't take uh, birthdays seriously in the way we might. So you, you're going to have a range. And then when I want to search for records, I, I use that range. And I look for name changes, just you know, not even dramatic name changes, just uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see some examples. But I, when I find a name change, I search under the new ones, because sometimes I'll find them under one of the names and not the others. One of the things I do is I build a census spreadsheet. And yeah, you know, we all bring kind of our background into our genealogy. And my background was in finance. So I do a lot of spreadsheets and I find it really useful for analyzing the information. So what I do is basically I'm taking the information from the census, I'm putting it into a spreadsheet. I'm calculating some certain things that aren't in every census. Every census is a little bit different. For example, I'm interested in the year of birth in each census. You'll see in 1900, they, that's the one where they will give you the month and the year. All the others will just give you the age. So I calculate those. I think that's, you know, I'm mainly looking at the ranges and then I, I code them. So you'll see SCL. I just pulled up part of my spreadsheet because I have many families in it. This is Samuel Cohen, SC, and then L for his wife, Lena. That's just my coding convention. And then I put in filters. And that means I can pull up family groupings or individuals. And it, it helps me when I find information and I'm trying to figure out, does this apply to the people I have? I, I want to focus in on the individuals. So that's basically what I'm doing. I'm going to give you, I, thought, I can't talk about filters without showing you kind of the mechanics. So I'm going to show you one slide on that because it's a really useful tool. If you, and this is all in Excel, is what I'm working with. And if you go to the top, you'll see a bar across with a green bar, has data, review, view, and a whole bunch of other things. I click on data and it comes up with the filters. The filter, you'll know it's the filters because it has a little funnel. And you're gonna wanna pay attention to the filter and the clear. Then you mark the row, you, you select the row you want, which is I did the top row. 
and you hit filter and voila, you have filters. And what when you click on it, I click, clicked on this very first one, you'll see that there's a kind of an arrow going up. It's because I had clicked ascending. You can put it, you know, sort it so it's ascending or descending. It has select all marked. So you'll see it picked up all the different groups I had on the page. Now, if I go here, if I clicked on select all, so I get rid of it, then it all goes blank. And then I clicked on ACP and it pulled up this particular grouping. So it's just an easy way to work with it. And I use this often. So you'll, you'll, you'll see me refer to that again. And I thought it would be helpful to just kind of show you very quickly. So I gathered all that information, did the foundation, built out as far as I could, both in Minneapolis and Milwaukee, and I kind of hit a dead end. So I went back to my client and I said, do you have anything that scrap of paper that a family member jotted some family history things on? And I asked that question because when my father passed away, I was the one who went into his study, which was a real mess. I wouldn't let my brother or sister go in because I want, I was sure there was going to be some family history stuff and I didn't want them to throw it out inadvertently because they would not have known to focus on it. And I did find things because I knew when I got into family history, my father was really intrigued with it and he contacted all his cousins who I didn't know. And while he told me some things, I always wondered if there's stuff he forgot. So I had done that myself. And so because of that, it occurred to me to ask him if he had anything like that. And guess what? He came up with this. And I know you can't read it very well on the side, so we'll, I'll pull it into a readable order. But I thought it was interesting because notice on the far right, it says 6450 per person, needles, pins, and thread. And I was looking for a thread. So I thought that was just perfect. Uh, kind of ironic. So what it says on there is Sheba's mother, Betty, raised Joe. And I said to him, do you know who Sheba and Betty are? Because Joe was his grandfather. And he said, no, not a clue. Okay, that sounded interesting. The great grandfather lived in Minneapolis. So I figured I could certainly get back another generation, some cousins names, never found the people on the West side, two sisters and 6450. So it's kind of slim pickings, but there's some good stuff in there. And what particularly interested me was um, this one, Sheba's mother, Betty raised Joe. That's a good clue because what it has, I, we have Sheba, which is an unusual name, and we have Betty and we have their relationship. And we know that Joe lived in Minneapolis and then Milwaukee. So I have a lot of data points that if I can match them up, I can be pretty sure I've got the right person. So I put a strategy together. I list out the questions and then I think about how I'm going to find the answer. And I wanted to learn who Betty was. And I, I was interested in that name in particular because when I was going through the city directories, I ran across a Betty Cohn. I didn't know who she was, but the addresses seemed to overlap a little bit. And I was just curious about that. So when her name popped up, I paid attention. So I was going to search for her and Sheba together. And I was going to search on Sheba because the, I searched on the unusual name first. I wanted to know her maiden name. I was pretty sure it might be the same person, but I wanted to get a marriage record to determine what the maiden name was. I wanted to know both her father's name and Sam's father's name because I thought they might be siblings. Because if she raised his kids, she probably was a close family member. That was my hunch. So to get that, because it's Minnesota, I used death records. If it was somewhere like New York, I could also use marriage records. The records here do not have the parents' names until much later. So I was focusing on the death records. And then are there other family members in the U.S.? And who are they and where do they live? That's directories and censuses and obits and newspapers. And just because I do a search initially doesn't mean that's the end of it. So I had gone to, to city directories, but now I had a new piece of information. So I had to go back and weigh that information against what I found and maybe look for some new information beyond that. So this is what I do when I'm searching this. I started out just doing an ancestry search. 
As I mentioned, I searched on the most unusual name. I actually tried it putting Betty in just to see what would happen. And, and very, it, it was not nearly as effective. What I do is I put Sheba here. I did Minneapolis and I also did Milwaukee. And um, I put Betty as the mother. So we have their relationship captured within this. And I got quite a few records. This is a record that actually came up in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. And first of all, where it says Petty, it really is Betty. I went and looked at the original. I don't know how they got to Petty. But Betty Juster married Leo Juster, and they had a daughter named Sheba Juster. And Sheba's an unusual enough name that uh, I have a fair amount of confidence. And they showed up in both Minneapolis and in Milwaukee. So, okay, I'm thinking, okay, I have a family member. I'm not, still not quite sure what, but I'm pretty sure they're part of the family. Then I went to the city directories. Now in Minnesota, certainly in Hennepin County and Ramsey County, the city directories are online or you can go to the library or you can, there's any number of places if you wanna work with the physical books. It sounds like in, including the Hennepin History Library, History Museum. And I knew approximately when they came in from the census record. So I started going through looking for where they first show up. And I found a couple of very interesting things. First of all, notice at the top where it says K-O-H-N-C, also Cohen, Cohen, they spell it a zillion different ways. Well, they were aware that it, at that time that it was spelled many different ways. So that's a tip off and a reminder. I'm looking for address overlaps. I'm looking for family groupings of the names that I know, and I'm looking for other new ones that are associated with them. So you look at 1889 and we have Alter, Isaac, Bertha, and Simeon, I don't know how that's pronounced. And they're all at the same address. By 1891, we have Bessie, Bertha has become Bessie, which is a change that seems fairly normal. Alter spelled slightly different. Isaac is now Ignatz. And Sigmund, now notice he's, he's actually on another street and I think that's probably an error given that the first part is the same, but I think he's Simeon or Simon. And then 1892, we have Alter, now it's Betsy, Isaac. 1893, we've come to Betty. And now it's Reverend Alter Cohen. And I actually had found records where it says, I think the Romanian Jewish church or something like of that nature. And then Isaac Cohen and Michael, who I think was his son. And then in 1895, Leon Juster appears. Now, I already know that the one we're looking for is married to Leon Juster. So I'm figuring we're in the right turf. 1895, I finally find Samuel Cohn, the father of Joseph Cohn, who is this guy's grandfather. Now, I had found a few other Samuel Cohns, but I wasn't sure if they were the right one. But now he's showed up geographically in the same area. So what's interesting, 1895, he's at 506 11th Avenue. Next year, Leon Juster is across the street. The following year, he's where Leon Juster was. And Leon and Betty have gotten married and they're down the street. And then they all disappear because they go to Milwaukee and Alter remains. So I know I'm, I'm kind of nosing into something here. Okay, so you'll notice we have Bertha, Bessie. Uh, these are more name changes, Ignatz and, and, and Betsy, Betty. Also notice they have Cone, they're spelled, they, they live at the same address at least Ignatz does, and he's spelling it with a K and the other two are spelling it with a C. So it does change. So I want to get the marriage record and to get the marriage record, a couple ways you can do it. There's moms.mn.gov. That's in the handout. You can go into their index online. I do that. And here I have put in Leon Juster and I find in 1895, Leon Juster married Betty Cohn. If I wanted to get the, the marriage record, I can purchase it for $9 or there's another way to get it. And I'm gonna use it as, oh, oh, you do have to set up a free account too. That's the other thing to remember. There's some ways you can go about using family search for this. When, if you wanna work with just the indexed records, you go to search and then records. And uh, we're gonna do that comes up with a field like this. I put in Leon Juster. I figured it was less common than Cohn as a name and um, clicked on it and it comes up with this record. 
Now, this basically has the information that's in the record. And if you click on at the far end, you see there's a little document. It's going to give you essentially the same thing, but in a different structure. And that's really all I need at this point. However, let me show you how you actually can get the record. I'm going to go to catalog. Cat seven, I think I heard like 70% of what they have is not yet indexed. If you go to catalog, you can find a lot of records that used to be on microfilm, now are digitized or in the process of getting digitized. They have some indexes within it, you know, like that accompany it, but they are not pulled out into a form where you can search by name. And this will help you find the original document. And so what I do, and it searches both indexed and undexed. Unindexed. I just put in Minnesota. I did a place search. It populates the United States. And then it comes up with a whole page of links. But I went to Vital Records. Within Vital Records, it says Minnesota County Marriages, 1860 to 1949. They got married in 1895. It should be in there. So I click on that and it comes up with Minnesota County Marriages are available online. Click here. So it's guiding me through it. I come up with a field just like what I filled out before on the record side, and it looks pretty similar, except notice what I've circled. There's a photograph. And if you click on the photograph, you will find the marriage license. Um, so it is available, and that's just a real quick and dirty, if you haven't used Family Search in that way, to remember to use the catalog because um, you're going to find a lot more that may be available. I then wanted to get the death records because I wanted to figure out if Sam and Betty were siblings. So I get the death record for um, Betty and it has her father's name as Alter. Now I perk up at that because we know we have an Alter and he was at the same address as Betty. So I think I'm in the right area here. All I need to do is match Sam. I click get Sam's and it says Elazar. Hmm. So not quite a match, but I know that with Jewish records, there often are two names. One might be a Hebrew name. Um, I'm not sure yet. The jury's out. I need more information before I can say it's relevant or it's not. So I want to get a death record for Alter, and I'm thinking that will help me solve the puzzle. So each step takes you to the next. And to do that, I go to the Minnesota Historical Society. If I click on research, it'll take me down to the records and indexes. Notice they have digital newspapers. That has a lot of community newspapers. I used to get the American Jewish World there, but now the Jewish Archives has digitized the whole thing. So you can get more. They only went up to a certain point in time. Um, but there's lots of, you know, there's Swedish ones and, and some, in, some in the original language, mind you. But you can find a lot more in some of the kind of community or ethnic newspapers uh, that focused on that area, as we will see. If you go, go further down to the Minnesota People's Record Search, that's where you will find the birth and death indexes, not the records, the indexes. So you can see the dates that they have for birth and death records. They also have some state censuses. I put in alter, I put in cone, and notice I click on sounds like because I already know that cone can be spelled many different ways. Exactly would not be a good idea. You can choose the county, but I figure this is a not very common first name. So I figure I'll try a, a really broad search first and see what I get. I get two records. One for some uh, alter cone who died in 1931 and one in 1921. Either could be them. Before I go to the Minnesota Historical Society to get copies, which you can copy or scan there, or you can pay them $9 for each record, I figure I'm going to do a search on newspapers.com. I'm going back to where I was before, and I want to see if um, there's an obituary. I know when they died, so it's easy to look in that period of time. And I find a really detailed one for the first one who died in 1931. None of the names tie out to what I know. So I put that one aside and I focus on the other one. And <laughs> they were a little sparse. They have Alter Cone, age 71 and his address. So that didn't help me a lot. So instead I went to Find a Grave. Find a Grave is a free site. I find his tombstone and 
What's interesting about this, first of all, it has the Hebrew and Jewish tombstones are going to have the Hebrew name and then son of Ben and then the father's name. So I look at the, his Hebrew name, Eleazar. So Sam and Betty are siblings. One had one name, the other had the other. Um, and it also gives me his father's name, which, which looks like Shabbat. It actually looks like Shabbat. And there is a name that derives from that if you're born on Shabbat. Uh, so there's still a challenge here. And we're going to have to work through some inconsistencies. It says 1839. And if you look at the 71 and it's 1921, he would have to be born in 1850. So which is it? Well, this is where I go back to the census record and I look at what's the year of birth. And surprisingly, it ranges from 1839 to 1850. 1839 is what he gave us when he first came over in 1895. And I usually lean towards the one that's closest to the event. And then it just floats all over the place. Um, the paper and the death certificate, because I went over and I picked, got the death certificate. They both have him as age 71. And I'm sure the paper got it from the death certificate. Somebody in the year until they put up the tombstone figured it out. And I think they're closer to the accurate number. Because the other thing I do is I look at relationships. So his son Samuel was born in 1864, which would mean that if the paper and the death certificate were correct, he was 14 years old at the time his son was born versus 25. I'm betting it's the 1839. So you, you, and you may never get an absolute answer on this, but you logic your way through. Then I decided to do a search on the American Jewish world because at first I had dismissed that because Samuel was gone from the area by the time they started publishing around. They started in 1912 under one name and, and then 1915 kind of took off, but Alter remained. So I did a search for Alter and they had much more information. That's community newspapers or, or ones that are targeted at a com particular community are very helpful. It says Reverend Alter Cohn. So Reverend, as which we saw in the um, city directory, one of the, the oldest shocked him, kosher butchers in Minneapolis, uh, tells us when he died, tells us the same address that was in the paper. So we know we have the same guy where he's buried, which is where the tombstone was. And then it has this wonderful line, the Shaktim of the Twin Cities acted as pallbearers and the cortege led past the South Side synagogues. I thought that was kind of lovely. And then it gets even better because then it tells us his survivors. It says he survived by a widow, uh, Pearl, I found their census records, um, three sons, Zygmunt of Minneapolis, Sam and Isaac of Milwaukee, and two daughters, Mrs. Betty Juster, and they gave her her first name, which seemed unusual at that time, of Milwaukee. And then it had someone I didn't know, I hadn't run across her, Mrs. Stena Cohn. And I realized she was Esther in the earlier uh, census. Yeah. Stena, I think, is derived from Ernestine, because sometimes she was Stena, Stena. Um, and she later took back Esther as her name and moved to Milwaukee and joined her siblings. So I go back to what did we want to know? We wanted to know if Sam and Betty are related. Yes, they are. They are siblings. Are there other family members in the United States? A father, a stepmother, two brothers, a sister? And if so, who are they and where did they live? Well, we know where they all lived. And most of them ended up in Milwaukee. And can we work back a generation from Sam? Well, Alter took us back to the great, great, let me get my great straight, great, great, and Shabtai was the great, great, great of my client. Now, the reason he was interested in this research was he and his wife were having a baby and they wanted to know family names. And they ended up, they had a little girl and they named her, I think, Sophia Elazara or something. It was something like that. So um, it, it was kind of, kind of touching, kind of sweet. <laughs> so that's one case. And we're going to look at the same kind of process, but using a different different thread, different hint. So we're gonna move on to visitors from the past. And again, we're starting with what we, what do you know? And he didn't know a lot. He knew um, 
they, you know, he knew the grandparents. I knew he had a lot of information on other sides of the family, but this side was really kind of uncharted. So Harry Hoffman and Esther Ackerman lived in Minneapolis. They had three children, Grace, who was originally Gussie in the census, Bert and Frida. And they are, were supposedly from Romania near Bucharest. So what he wanted to know was family associated with grandparents, siblings, and parents. And our challenge was there was no knowledge of any siblings or family in the United States, and I couldn't get to the record online records in Romania. So I wasn't quite sure where this was going to take me and how far I was going to be able to go. So I begin with building the foundation as just as I did before, you know, do the newspaper search, go through city directories, gather census information, look for name changes. And it's, it's kind of the tedious part of genealogy. But I also know that the thread that may unlock it will likely arise there or else some information that I'm going to be will be important in the search. I did my census spreadsheet, nothing, not much more to tell you about that, but you can see, you know, I put the addresses in and the immigration and, and I condense it a little bit because it's a lot to fit in, especially on a slide. And then I go back, I take all that information and I say, okay, what did I learn from it? I'm cross-checking. I know for sure they're from Romania. Everything said Romania. I know Harry Hoffman came to the U.S. around 1899 to 1900. Esther came in 1903. They married in 1903. And they showed up in Minneapolis in 1903. So that was an important year. In the 1905 census, it says they had been there for two years. Now, Harry was listed as Harry through all the earlier records and all the city directories. But the census in 1920, 1930, and 1940, he was Herman. And, and I, I wasn't sure if it was like that was considered a more official record and that was the official name, I'm, I'm really not sure the logic behind it. The birth years varied for Harry within a three-year span. So 1870 to 1873. And for Esther from 1882 to 1885, and you can see there's an age span between them. So I got to the point where I needed a thread. I'd gathered everything I could gather. I needed one more thing to work with. So. I went to my client. I said, do you remember anything else? And he said, he actually gave me two clues. I'm going to tell you one of them now. Um, he said he, there was a woman named Bess Proper from New York who came to visit his grandparents. He thought, I think his grandmother. And he didn't know who she was. He thought she might be related, but he just didn't know. So it wasn't hard to find out. I did a search on Bess Proper from New York. And I came up with her father was Harry Ackerman. And I have her, so I have her father and her mother and her birth year, same last name as Esther. So we know we're in the family. And it gives me the thread that she was born in 1909 to Harry Ackerman and Minnie Schwartz. So I answered that question, but it raised another question. Now I know who Bess is. Who's Harry? So I began doing research on Harry and I found several census records. They started out under Hyman. Uh, then went to Harry. I figured he probably was a Hyam when he came over, if it was Hyman. It gave his wife and children's names. And these are the pre-best names because she wasn't born till 1909. I found a 1907 petition for naturalization um, on family search. And it was under Henry Ackerman. But I knew it was the right one because it had the correct children. So I had some data points to match. I had the children's names. I had the wife. It told me he was from Galatz, born in 1877, so in the same age cohort as Esther, likely a brother is my hunch, and he arrived in 1901. So now I sit back and I say, okay, what do I know? Do I have a hypothesis? What's my strategy? I, I know that Galatz, it's also Galati, I don't know how you actually pronounce it, uh, it's likely the ancestral town of the Ackermans and probably the Hoffmans, because if she came over and 1903 and got married in 1903. They knew each other before. I am thinking that Harry Ackerman is likely a sibling to Esther. And as I said, I thought his original name was Hyam, which became Hyman, which became Harry. And sometimes it was Henry. And my strategy was to see if I could find the parents for Harry and Esther and see if they match. So that's where I'm going with this. 
At first, I wanted to take a look at the lots and see where it was. It's 118 miles from Bucharest, and it used to be part of Moldova. Now it's in Romania. Typically, people round up to the nearest large city near them if they're from a smaller town. Uh, so that's not unusual. And it, uh, usually it's around 100 miles. You know, they'll, they'll still do that. So 118 is in the ballpark. And that was just, I was just curious how far it was and if it was near Bucharest. And then I wanted to figure out who were Harry Ackerman's parents. Now this, they were in New York and that opens up an avenue of stevemorse.org. And uh, if you haven't used Steve Morse, you are gonna wanna explore it because it's a great resource. Steve Morse is a computer guy and he's also a genealogist. And just as I bring my finance background to what I do, he brought his computer background. Ellis Island had just gone online when he started getting into this and they had, you could only search on a couple of variables. But when you got you know, the information after your search, it had a lot of data points. And he said, well, hold on a minute. If they have those data points tied to the name, I should be able to search on them. And so he created a way to do that. And then he started working his way through all the different genealogy puzzles and creating better search tools. So he uses existing databases, but he creates a better search engine. So you'll see on these, I, I went down just to the section. This is, you'll see a whole page of links. So you really have to just dissect it for what you want. Um, but it's really good for New York stuff, especially. Uh, so these are, you'll see in the first one, it says searching the New York City birth index in one step, family search in parentheses. The next one, same thing, IgG, that's Italian gen. Next one is ancestry. Those are the databases that he's searching. Now, I'm interested in both the marriage and the death records because they will give me parents' names in New York. And I always search with family search first because they more consistently pick up the parents' names. Ancestry will sometimes, but I, I always find them on family search. So I, I click on the link. I put in who I'm looking for, and this is what I get. The marriage record for Harry and Minnie says his father is Isaac Ackerman, and the mother is Betta Bercovicio. That threw me at first, but we'll dissect that a little bit. The death record, father's Isaac, same thing. Mother Bessie, which you could see where Betta would become Bessie, but now it's Cohn. Now, Jews did not take last names until around 1820, somewhere in that vicinity. It varied by country, but in that ballpark. And before that, they used patronymic, so it's the father's name with um, an ending. So not too different from Carlson or Johnson, but it's um, Herskovitz. <laughs> you know, so that's the difference. This, this has a Slavic suffix. So it's not one that I typically see, but I did a little searching and it said, yeah, it's a suffix that would mean, you know, like child of or son of, um, or in this case, daughter of. And so Burke, it would be the father's name if it's a patronymic. And what was interesting to me is Harry Hoffman and Esther had a son named Bert. And if my hunch was correct about Esther and Harry, he was likely named after his maternal great-grandfather, Burke. So looking promising. I went to the Minnesota Historical Society to do a search for the death record for Esther. And I pull it up and it says her father is Isidore, which is the Americanized version of Isaac, and her mother is Bessie. So it's a match. So... I want to talk a little bit about immigration records because we're going to pull some up. And there's a couple things that you want to think about in terms of the information you're likely to find. And, and immigration manifest, but also the naturalization records, which relate to that. So the naturalization records are typically the declaration and the petition that are filed at different time periods. And there's a certain amount of time before you can file the next one. The naturalization records after 1906 will tell you the ship and the dates so you can work backwards to the manifest. And that's really useful. And since I had his naturalization record, that's exactly what I did for uh, Harry. After 1893, the manifest tells you who they are going to in the United States. A family member, I think it specifies actually, although they often put different people. And that is a fabulous resource. And I've been able to build out whole trees using that information because then you research that person and then you research the people attached to them and pretty soon you have a tree. 
After 1906, the manifest will tell you the nearest relative in Europe. So depending on when they came over, we'll be able to get different information. So I wanna find out when Harry Ackerman arrived. And remember, I assume because he was Hyman in the first, I think it was like the 1905 census, he probably was Hyam. Um, his naturalization petition said <laughs> May 19th, 1901. Census records were 1899 to 1900. I found his manifest on February, 1900. Again, they're imprecise, they're going on memory, but the port and the ship tied to his petition and, and the people he named within it, the family members. Kaya Ackerman from Galatz going to an uncle Guterman, another name we wanna pay attention to because it will appear again. And then I'm thinking, okay, I'm looking up marriage and death records. Maybe I should look up the obvious marriage record something between a Hoffman and an Ackerman. And I, so I did a search on Steve Morse and I left out the, you know, the given names. I just wanted to see what came up with a Hoffman and an Ackerman. And this is what I got. 1903 marriage, right where it was supposed to be. Harry Hoffman and Ernestine Ackerman. The witnesses were H. Ackerman and somebody with the surname Claire, K-L-A-H-R, it didn't give a given name. And Harry's father was Morris. Now, Ernestine's was a little more mysterious. The father was listed as J-A-K. I thought, Jacob? And that kind of was blowing my theory that it was uh, Isaac. So I wasn't sure I liked that. And so I kind of squinted at it and thought, it could be Isaac. So to get that, to do that, to check that out, I needed to get the original record. So I ordered the record. Meanwhile, I took the name Ernestine and I searched in the immigration records and came up with Ernestine coming from Galatz, traveling with a Guterman from Galatz, going to her brother, H. Ackerman. She arrived June 10th, 1903, got married June 22nd. I think I've got my gal. So we want to assess the marriage record. And we know 1903 is the year that's cited in the 1905 census. So that makes sense. The timings after Ernestine arrives of, of the marriage is you know, opposed to before. The first witness was likely her brother. The second witness, spoiler alert, will prove to be family on the Hoffman side. Morris was a family name that was repeated in the family. I'm still stuck on this. Could Jack be Isaac? So I get the original record. I blow up the Jack and it's not attached at the top. I compare it with an A in Bate. And it certainly looks to me like it could be an I-C-E-K. I mean, you're dealing with handwriting. So, um, you know, it, it depends if other, other things support it, but thus far everything else has supported it. So I am optimistic that that's the case. Now I'm thinking if Esther was Ernestine, I probably should look for Herman for Harry because I already know he went by Herman in the last couple censuses. So I do a search. And I'd looked for Harry and Esther before, by the way, said I was not finding anything. Yeah, you know, that looked like it was a good match. So I did a search here. I have Herman Hoffman arriving 1899, which is when it, census records said he arrived <clears throat> from Galatz, age 28. So I now know that Galatz is the town of origin for Harry, for Esther, and for Harry Hoffman. So the Ackermans and the Hoffmans. And the date of arrival ties to the 1900 census information that I then found looking for Herman. He's living with his sister's family, his sister, Jenny Hoffman Clare, the same surname as the witness to the marriage. And the other clue, he's living at 115 Essex with her, her husband, two daughters. The daughters are named Gussie and Ida. Remember, Harry and Esther named their first daughter Gussie. So I'm quite sure that's a family name. And actually there's something that shows up on the marriage certificate uh, in that vein. So then I take, I, I look for a naturalization record for Herman. And this is before they give you much information at all. But notice it does tell us the address. It's 115 Essex, which ties to the census record that I found. He does this in the Southern District of New York, April 17th, 1900. Keep that in mind, you're gonna see it again. And it basically, he's renouncing you know, his loyalty to the King of Romania in this case. Uh, it tells us he's born in 1872 and arrived October, 1899. All of that ties out with everything we found. 
So now that I have Galatz as a, a place to work with, I think, well, I should do a search and put Galatz in the keyword field in Ancestry and see what comes up. And surprise, I come up with another brother. They're just coming from all directions. I have Aaron Hers Ackerman. Now, what's interesting about that, Hers actually usually becomes Harry, but he's an Aaron. So I'm finding that interesting. Not quite sure what's going to happen here. Shows up in July 1900, going to his brother, Chaim Ackerman. And I find his declaration and a passport file. And um, he's a dress designer. In 1920, he's going to Paris for his work with high fashion couture. His marriage record shows his parents as Isaac Ackerman and Bate Ackerman. So we have a brother. I'm quite certain of that. And we're not done yet. Ten years go by in genealogy time. <laughs> not my time. I do another search on Galatz. And I come up with an Isig. And I thought at first it was like an Isaac, but it, you know, you wouldn't name a child after the father. So it's it. And I looked it up and I think it means one who smiles or one who laughs, something like that. It's kind of an interesting meaning from Romania Galatz. And this is in 1910. So it has the nearest relative in Europe. And the father, Isaac Ackerman in Galatz, is listed. And he's going to his brother, Harry Ackerman. So all the pieces click into place. And we're still not done yet. When I had first checked with my client on any other names that we could work with, he told me about somebody in Sydney, Australia. It was a doctor. And I think when we first were talking, we weren't sure if it was uh, AI or IA, but he had the initials. And he came to visit his grandmother. And his last name was Ackerman. So we knew there was some relationship, but we didn't know what. And I didn't find him when I first started searching. I was looking for Abrahams and um, but I'm on the, the board of the International Jewish Genealogical Associations. And, um, and I, because of that, I have been paying attention to some of the other groups that um, are around the world. And I thought, well, I should go check out the Australian Jewish Genealogical Society and see what they have. And lo and behold, good resource, Trove is a newspaper search. And I was able to find considerable information there. They have birth, marriage, death, vital records. And sometimes they're just, they're linking to other things. And some, I think they, they did the databases themselves. Cemeteries. I thought, ah, let me search the cemetery. And there I found Dr. Isidore Antonio Ackerman. And you'll notice his Hebrew name, Yitzhak, named after his grandfather, Isaac, son of Nuta, and, and we found in some other documents that helped us verify that Nuta was another brother. And from Galati, he came over after the war. He, he became a, studied in Bucharest to become a doctor, and he was a nephew to Esther. And they have a little bit of a family tree with names, but not a lot of last names, which would have been helpful. So he was kind of an unexpected find. And at that point, we've built it out quite a bit. Now, I want to cover one last leg, and that is how did they get to Minnesota? I wanted to know, is the Herman Hoffman of New York the guy we're calling Harry in Minnesota, and how do we connect New York to Minnesota? And that's a fairly simple thing to do, although it sounds more complex than it actually is. I went to the Industrial Removal Office records, and those are at the uh, Center for Jewish History in New York, but you can do it online. And they, they were kind of in business from 1899 to 1922. Their purpose was to help Jewish immigrants assimilate into American society. And so they helped them relocate to other cities in the middle of the country, and they helped them find employment. They had you know, networks all over the country um, identifying needs for jobs. And so I did a search. All I did was put in Hoffman in 1903 and up pops. H. Hoffman, and now Esther. No more Ernestine, now it's Esther from here on out. Um, in 1903, going to St. Paul. So they figured out how to cross the river apparently along the way because they ended up in Minneapolis. The actual records themselves are at Ancestry. So you go to one place for the index and then you have to go to Ancestry to find the records. And they actually were missing the page that this would be on. Um, it's not going to give me a ton more information, but sometimes you pick up something. I also did a search for uh, a petition, um, the next step in the, the naturalization process in Minnesota, 
found one in 1906. They're still not giving us too much detail because it's before September 1906 when everything kind of changed for the better for genealogists. But it does ask where he filed his declaration, Southern District of New York, April 17th, 1900. That's our guy. We have that declaration. So it all ties together quite nicely. I want to just comment on the names because we have Herman to Harry, Ernestine to Esther. Herman kind of floated around back and forth between Harry and Herman, tended to be in the more, um, I don't know, probably government type records, except his marriage record where he was Harry. Ernestine, the minute she got into Minnesota, she changed to Esther. Chaim Ackerman, start was Chaim Hyman, Hyen is what it looks like in the marriage record, which could be, uh, they're just trying to figure out the handwriting, uh, Henry, and then Harry. And then with Aaron, he actually went by Harry for, there's two census records where both he and his brother are going by Harry. And he must have uh, lost the coin toss. He went back to Aaron. And the only reason I think I, I stumbled across him was because I was looking for Harry and I kept coming up with this Harry with the wrong wife. And then it dawned on me that he might be related. And I made the connection. So, so just let's map out the chronology. This is where you take all the stuff you found and put it together and you can kind of try to picture the story. So Herman arrives in New York, October, 1899. In right after that, a couple months later, he's living with his sister in New York at the address that he notes in his first naturalization filing. Harry, who was, came over as Chaim, Ara Ackerman arrives in New York in February, 1900 and is followed five months later by Esther's other brother, Aaron Hirsch. The father's name for both Herman and his sister is the same in their death records. And similarly, Esther, Harry, Aaron, they all share the same parents in their records. Also Isaac. Ernestine, when she's 23, arrives here June 10th, 1903. She goes to her brother. And then she gets married a couple weeks later. And less than a month after she arrived, they're in Minnesota. So we find them in the 1905 state census, says they've, they arrived two years earlier. Herman finishes his naturalization process in 1906. And then in 1910, the baby brother, because he was just a kid when everybody else came over, he arrives in the United States. And then in 1948, after the war, I.A. Ackerman, son of Nuta, the other sibling, arrives in Sydney, Australia. So that's our story. Our original objective was to identify family associated with grandparents, siblings, parents. Esther had um, the parents we identified, Isaac and Bessie, the four siblings, Chaim, Aaron, Isaac, and Nuta, a nephew and a niece, Tony Ackerman is what he went by, and best proper, and all the descendants. And Harry had a sister, Jenny Claire, and a whole bunch of descendants. So from that, we were able to come up with 188 people out of the information on those two visitors, really, which opened it up. So takeaways. We need to find a thread to begin. It could be an envelope with something jotted on it. It could be a long ago visitor. It's basically a lead. And leads take many forms, but it's good if they have a lot of data points that you can try to confirm. I build a foundation. I do the, it's the grunt work the censuses, the directories, the addresses, and, and you're just kind of looking for clues as you do that. I then identify a hypothesis or several and strategies to test them. I use marriage records to find maiden names, marriage and death records to find parents' names. I match the parents' names to identify siblings and real, and, and I really have to understand some of the cultural issues, whether it's the names on tombstones or double names. There's there's things, and each group is different in that. So those are the nuances that, you know, you really need to focus on because you could discard something. I could have said, ah, that's the two different names. That's not, not, there's no relationship. And in fact, there was a relationship, even though we had Elazar and we had Alter. Um, we're looking for family groupings and addresses. We're working back from one person to the next. And you're going to have lots of inconsistencies that, are, that arise. Certainly we know in ages, also names, they tried on different names. Um, handwriting is going to result in transcription errors. And so I study the original document if I can get it. I consider the age at various life events to figure out which makes sense. And I do draw on community newspapers because they're going to have a lot more information sometimes than the regular paper. 
I expect names to change with some frequency along with ages. And I look for interlocking documents to trace a journey. So we've taken this tangle of threads. We found the thread that really unraveled the puzzle. We've tied it into a bow and we solved our puzzle. Thank you for your attention. Here's my contact information. Uh, you can reach me by email. My genealogy and art website is found at studio409art.com slash genealogy. We'll take you to the genealogy section. And if you go to the articles page, you'll find many articles that I've written for Hennepin History Magazine, as well as other publications and my blog on genealogy topics. Uh, most of the links in this presentation can be found at mnjgs.org on the resource page. Thank you very much for attending.